I couldn't even settle down to read that. I just couldn't read. So I did something that I don't recommend. I don't recommend this kind of Bible study, but you know, the Lord meets you where you are. I went into the kitchen and I made myself a double margarita. And then I went to the living room and I sat down and I lit up a cigarette. I started drinking and smoking and opened the steps to Christ, page one. And I was on page one when it hit me, what I was doing. And then I had a little talk with the Lord. I said, Lord, I didn't leave you over alcohol. I didn't leave you over cigarettes. These are little things. Can we talk about those later? You show me the answers to the real issues, and then we'll come back to this later. So I continued drinking and smoking and reading Steps to Christ. And I really think the Lord respected my honesty because these things cloud the mind to where you can't reason properly. You can't hear the voice of God. In chapter 5, I found myself putting on a perfectly good cigarette. You know what that is? A perfectly good one? Well, there's one. There's still, you see some white on it. It's still good. <laughs> anyway, Steps to Christ, chapter 5. And these are quotes from what I was reading. But in a nutshell, it was basically saying that, that everything God asks of me is for my own good. My own happiness, joy, fulfillment, you know. Uh, I was a fool to, to ignore that and that his plan for my life far exceeded anything I could even imagine for myself. How stupid had I been that I was going against the will of God and the word of God, trying to make myself happy, putting myself as number one, self-advancement, self-glory, self-gratification, self, self, self. God's way, if I would submit to it, all heaven is after my happiness. How do you compete with that? That's what I was learning. I was reading. How can I compete with God about my own happiness? I mean, how stupid have I been? And so, um, as I kept reading on, and, and there are many promises here that I refer to. If in man be in Christ is a new creature, old things are passed away, all things are become new. Uh, and then I came across in that study Bible, this quote, the new birth consists in having new motives, new tastes, and new tendencies. Where are you ever going to hear that? New tendencies? Are you kidding me? And then a genuine conversion changes both hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. And I started getting excited. I said, there is something to this that I never saw before. I was no longer studying for the professors to make the grade. I was studying for my very survival. In my own salvation, there's a big difference. I now started my journey with a relationship with the Lord. It made all the difference in the world. I started reading those books. I consumed everything. I ended up reading all of those books, that whole Bible, all the commentary, um, and it took a while to do it. But just, you know, in a nutshell, I found all of my answers. Everything I needed was in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Jesus was tempted in all points like as me, yet without sin. Why am I identifying myself by the nature of my temptations? That only reveals who Satan is. That doesn't reveal who I am. What reveals who I am is how I act under temptation. Jesus suffered being tempted. He struggled with temptation. I was wimpy. I got tired of the, stuff, the struggle and gave up. Jesus never gave up. He resisted under blood striving against sin. And uh, in other words, he chose to die rather than sin. So racing through all of that, I, in developing that relationship with the Lord, I was under such conviction and I began to love the Lord and love his word. There was one problem. I was in a relationship and it was for life. It was like a gay marriage. And we loved each other. We really did. What do you do? Well, I continued studying, and I was in that relationship for some time. But I was developing a ever-increasing relationship with the Lord to the point that finally I love the Lord more than my relationship. And when you get to the point that you love God more, <coughs> then you can walk away. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. So it was extremely difficult for me to break up that relationship. My friend turned on me with the vengeance of seven demons and almost killed me in the process. He was so angry and so upset. 
God let me go through that trauma, I think, to show me who I was really uh, in submission to was the devil. The devil wanted to kill me before I could be baptized. The Lord let me see that, but the Lord spared my life because he had a plan. He has a plan for all of us, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, Satan had taken me from the hand of Jesus and used me for his own glory, Satan's glory all those years. Now Jesus is taking me back to use me for his glory. Isn't it amazing? In this great controversy, the struggle is over you, not the devil doesn't love you, but he wants, he wants to hold you up as a trophy. You know, you are a trophy child to the devil. Jesus wants you back, not as a trophy, but as a peculiar treasure, that's for sure. But because he wants to be your father. He, he, he wants to be your savior. He loves you. So I moved in. I left Southern California, and I moved in with my parents. I left rather suddenly, left most everything behind, and um, I just really had to flee the scene from where I was living uh, to get away from all of the influences. I was a sales manager in five counties in Southern California. I was in a different county every weekday. I knew all of the gay hangouts in all of those counties. I couldn't live there anymore. I had to get away. So I just uprooted and moved in with my parents who had just moved to the Ozark Mountains to retire. So I'm moving from LA to the mountains of Arkansas, surrounded by trees and frogs and crickets. And the silence was, other than that, there is no freeway noise, there's no smog, there's no people, you know, all those things. It was, it was a real challenge for me to make that transition. But I stuck it out and I made it and now I love being there and, and I, I would, when we go back to visit California, I just praise God that I don't live here anymore. Yeah. I'm living where I need to live. You know, like Enoch lived up in the mountains, he lived away from the, all the sin and the, the cities and all that. Um, so now what happened to my computer? It tried to shut off. But anyway, as I moved in with my parents, you can imagine 40 years old and moving in with your parents, how humiliating that can be. I was there in the mountains, no job and no money. And then I got to reasoning, you know, the first time I was born, I had no job and no money. <laughs> <laughs> Being born again, no job, no money. Okay, start over. And so I just laid it for the Lord, but I felt this great conviction that this call to ministry, after all, I had the degree in theology. What was I to do about it? Okay. Are you reading all my messages? <laughs> Uh, we'll get there in a minute. Here we go. So, I didn't know how to, to respond to that conviction that I needed to be in ministry. And so, I decided to just write out my, my testimony and send it out to everybody that I could find. And I did that. And um, a couple weeks later, I got a letter from a high school friend, my best friend from high school, and Bill, you remember David Smith, and he and I had left the church at the same time, and um, equally degraded, but opposite directions, um, and uh, I used to say if any two people were never going to make it to heaven, he was one of them. <laughs> but I got this letter from him, and uh, he was saying, Ron, I, I'm reading your letter, and I'm really impressed. He said, I think it's time for me to come back too. And David Smith came back to the Lord. And he was pastoring here in Florida for quite a long time. I think recently he's, he's no longer. But he, he pastored here in Florida for years. Okay. This is giving me problems. Come on. not cooperating. Anyway, so at that point I realized maybe the Lord can use someone like me in ministry. I don't, um, 
I don't know how, but maybe he can. And so I um, started praying about it. And I remember giving my dad a copy of my testimony to take upstairs and read. You know, in Mark 5.19, uh, Jesus told the demoniacs to go home to their friends, tell them all the Lord had done for them, and that's what I decided to do. I'll just share my testimony. I gave my testimony to my dad to read. He took it right upstairs, and I heard him laughing. I mean, right away he was laughing. I thought, now why is he laughing, reading my testimony? There's nothing funny. This is serious. So I walked upstairs to find out, and I was so curious, what is he laughing about? And as I looked and peeked there around the corner, yes, he was reading my testimony, and he was chuckling. And I said, Dad, why are you laughing at my testimony? He said, I'm not laughing at your testimony. But you're laughing. What's so funny? He said, oh, look here. Right here you wrote, the Lord gave me no rest, day nor night. I said, so what's so funny about that? And then he said, for 16 years your mother and I prayed that the Lord would give you no rest, day nor night. There's our prayer, page one. There's our answer, page one. He was laughing for joy. Uh, do you see that for 16 years? Let that stick for a moment. Okay. The man whose heart I felt I had literally broken was now rejoicing in the Lord for the return of the prodigal son. I continued having a conviction about ministry, so I began to pray about it. I knew I couldn't take my application to the conference office, you know, Dennis, because, yeah, I could show my diploma application, but you'd probably want to see a resume. <laughs> and I didn't want you to see my resume, so I wasn't going to take my resume to the conference office, so I just prayed, Lord, if you want me to be in ministry, then you're going to have to make it happen. And I did the William Miller thing. I said, wherever I'm asked to go, I'll go. I'll just make that commitment, and that'll take care of it. Because like William Miller, I didn't think anyone would ask me to go preach. I mean, look at where I had been. And no one was asking me to preach. And no wonder, I was still smoking. I hadn't even been baptized yet. But I was still having these conversations. I didn't want to be baptized until I had the victory over the cigarettes. So I continued praying. And I, another prayer I prayed was, would, would you bless me with a double portion of your spirit upon my baptism? I want to redeem the time that I wasted all those years in the world. I had a degree in theology, did nothing about it. I remember a friend coming to me in the world, a gay person, and he was so depressed. He said, Ron, if I knew there was a way out, I would take it. Why am I this way? I don't want to be this way. And here I am, his friend, a degree in theology with not one word to share with that man because I didn't have my own answers. Isn't that sad? And I have, that has haunted me that I should have been able to help that that friend, but I was just as helpless and hopeless as he was. So now I'm asking for a double portion of the Holy Spirit to redeem the time I wasted all those years in the world. And then I came up with an interesting prayer, Lord, would you ever trust me again with family? Well, that's an odd thing to pray about, but in my mind, I had taken my, my homosexuality and I hung it on the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden. I was done with it. It's on the wrong tree, off limits, no longer an option. And I started praying, Lord, would you give me a second chance? Would you ever trust me again with family? And I had no inclination that I was praying about it anyway. And then the fourth thing I remember, I'm sure I prayed about a lot of things, but the fourth thing I remember about the music, um, leaving the world, I left the world of dance and all of that, and I had a void in my life for music, and I prayed, asked the Lord if he would restore the gift of music that I had squandered over all those years. So here's how the Lord answered those prayers real quickly. The very night I was baptized, I finally quit smoking, right? And then I was baptized. And it's like the Lord was just waiting. The very night I was baptized, a pastor came to me and said, would you preach at my church next Sabbath? And I've been in the pulpit ever since, 28 years in February, 28 years. Um, and I came into the church through maybe a back door, but I came all the way in. It was a process. And um, so the Lord launched me into ministry immediately. We were having a, 
an independent camp meeting of in North. This is true confessions. My ministerial secretary is here. <laughs> We were having an independent camp meeting up in Northwest Arkansas. I came into the church through the independent ministries. But I didn't realize we were at the same place. But they were going out and I was coming in. Mm. And as I, as I worked with them for about five years, I started to feel like they're going the wrong way. And we parted ways. Because I was coming into the church and they were going out. Um, but anyway, for me it was a stepping stone. We were having this beautiful camp meeting up there in Northwest Arkansas. And there was a fellow there who was listening to some gossip. Some man was gossiping about me at that camp meeting. I hadn't told anybody where I came from. I was ashamed. I just, when I told my testimony, I talked about being saved from a life of self-destruction and degradation. You fill in the blanks, right? And this guy was gossiping about me, and I didn't know about it. But then the, the gossiper, the gossipy, gossiper, gossipy. Okay, the gossipy came to me. And he looked at me kind of strangely and said, Pastor Ron, man, if God can save you, he can save anybody. <laughs> and I was startled. And I said, what do you mean by that? And then he told me about the gossip he had heard. I said, oh, that. Well, some of it's true. Most of it's true. A lot of it's true. But it's true. God can save anybody. And then he said, would you baptize me? That's why I call it the gospel according to gossip. <laughs> I hadn't prepared him for baptism. He was already a Seventh-day Adventist. But when he heard that God could deliver someone like me, it was like new life, and he wanted to rededicate his life to the Lord. So that's the gospel according to gossip. But anyway, I was launched into ministry. After, at the end of the camp meeting, I had I baptized about 12 people. And as I was, uh, I love this picture. That, that's not the baptism, but I just love the picture. But as I was turning to get out of the, the baptismal water, I heard a motion behind me. And I turned around, and there was my dad standing in the water, fully dressed, saying, Ronnie, baptize me too. Now, he was an elder in the church. And he said, baptize me too. And you don't argue with your daddy in a baptismal tank. Right? It's not the place to come to do that. I rebaptized my own father and as we were walking away he's very emotional tears running down his cheeks I said dad what was that all about he said ronnie i want what you have and what did i have he saw the holy spirit working through my ministry in a way that he wanted for himself he said i want whatever it is you have i want it too isn't that something yeah. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd that day when i was baptizing my own father um, there, was a, there was a young lady at that baptism and at that camp meeting, and she didn't have a dry eye either. Um, <laughs> Claudia and I had known each other since childhood. My sisters brought her around when she was in the grade school at Madison. My sisters wanted their grade school girls to meet their high school brothers, right? And I was in the ninth grade. Well. I wasn't interested in Claudia. She was in grade school, the whole things, you know. And, uh, you know, she was in the eighth grade. I was in the ninth grade. <laughs> That's the difference between grade school and high school, you know. Well, the next year, I went to Little Creek Academy, and she showed up there, too. And so, over the years, we became very good friends. And, uh, actually, when was it we were married? It was in 1972? Yeah. 73. We were both married on August 5, 1973. But to different people. <laughs> we didn't know that. Things got spooky as we started carrying, uh, comparing notes. Her wedding cake was a carrot cake in Tennessee, and my wedding cake was a carrot cake in California. And we stopped comparing notes after that. It got too weird. But anyway, by the end of that camp meeting, she was there with her son, who was 10 years old at the time, and she agreed to go with me on a date. And I was shocked, and I mean, no one was more shocked than I was. I was shocked that I had the nerve to even ask, because, you know, where I had been and so forth. We planned to go to Little Creek Homecoming. The, the camp meeting was October 22. The homecoming was two weeks later. And so she agreed to go with me to the homecoming and I showed up at her house in Madison in Nashville area 
And um, she said, Ron, you brought your sister. I said, yeah. Why did you bring your sister? I said, well, we're going out of town for the weekend. I'm a pastor. We have to avoid the appearance of evil. But you brought your sister. I said, we need a chaperone. <laughs> so the three of us went on a date. We had a great time. My sister, Melody, she knew when to disappear. You know, she also knew when to reappear. She was a pretty good chaperone. But one night she came to me while we were at this homecoming, or one morning, she came to me and she said, Ronnie, Claudia said something last night I probably shouldn't tell you. And I don't know why you women do that to us men. <laughs> if you shouldn't tell, then don't bring it up, okay? I shouldn't tell you what she said last night. Oh yeah, I'll go ahead and tell you. I know you're dying to know. Okay? <laughs> she said, Claudia said last night, I don't know what your brother is up to, but I wish he'd hurry up. <laughs> and that's the truth. She's right here. I wouldn't lie in front of her. I wish he'd hurry up. I mean, what? Hurry up? This is our first date. So I hurried up and I asked her to come back to Arkansas for Thanksgiving. Two weeks later, she came with her son and and while there, I got up my nerve. We went for a long walk in the woods, and those woods came in handy. You know, I left L.A., and now we had all the, the forest. Took her to a little cave over in the canyon view, and got up my nerve, and I asked her if she'd marry me. And I was expecting, because I'm seeing this green light in my head, you know, and she looked at me, and she just started laughing. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> And then she said, Ronnie, I always knew you were slow. But I never thought it'd take you 30 years. She said, I've been in love with you since the eighth grade. <laughs> I guess that was a yes. So we started planning our wedding. And that was going to be six weeks later. I know this all sounds very fast, right? But we were old. Why wait? And we'd known each other for 30 years. So we planned our wedding for six weeks later, New Year's Eve, so we'd never forget it. The whole world celebrates our anniversary. So before going to Nashville for the wedding, she called and said, Ron, there's a there's a marimba set up here at the church. See if you can find some of your old music arrangements and bring them. I want you to play the marimba for our wedding. That was very strange. I hadn't played the marimba for years. And she insisted that I bring music and play for the wedding. Remember, I had prayed that the Lord would restore the gift of music. Yeah. I showed up the day before the wedding. I picked up the four mallets just like tonight. And the very first song that I played tonight was the song I played there, the Lord's Prayer. I arranged that in high school. In the Green Cathedral, A Perfect Day, Blessed His House. And I, I don't remember how many songs I played, but I played several songs for our wedding the very next day. And I could do it. It's like the Lord restored the gift immediately. Hallelujah. And I've been using marimba in ministry ever since. I think it's a pretty good addition to my ministry. At least I like it. I like it to me. It's, a, it's just a niche. I love doing message and music, or music and message, either way. So, the Lord, you see how the Lord was answering all those prayers? Ministry, the Holy Spirit, family, I was now married. Uh, oh, yeah, there. Uh, we had the wedding. Uh, I was married with a family. And the music, uh, that was being restored. And then, two weeks later, we realized the Lord was really still answering prayer because we had a midwife visiting. And our wedding theme had been Isaac and Rebecca. And people were now joking, it should have been Abraham and Sarah. Claudia <laughs> <laughs> was expecting, and the midwife thought we were going to have twins. Both of our parents, our mothers, assured us there were twins on both sides of the family we had known nothing about. And, I remember Claudia pointing her finger at me and saying, it's time for you to stop praying for those second chances and double portions. <laughs> a few months later, Zachary was born, and he was not a twin. That was a false alarm. Nineteen months later, Natalie was born, and, and uh, she was not a twin either. Uh, this is a recent picture of Zachary. And um, the Lord bless us with a beautiful family. And Natalie, uh, she was graduating from high school. This is our Claudia's son, Derek, and that little boy right there, Mr. Caden. You know, I didn't, Janae, I'm sorry, I didn't have a picture of the whole, the three of you. I'm taking the pictures. Oh, you're taking the picture. Well, can you stand up so they can see you? Because she's a part of the track. Okay. 
so that's part of our family. People ask about my, my older children and my ex-wife. We've had beautiful reconciliation with my ex-wife, who's married to a retired chaplain. Uh, he especially is very fond of our ministry, the music, and all of that. Uh, this is my oldest daughter. Uh, she is 45. You saw a picture of Zachary. Zachary's 25 in December. And this is her son, um, Benton, at his graduation. Well, he and Zachary are the same age. Claudia and Melody were pregnant at the same time. Interesting dynamics in our family. Um, and this is my oldest son, David, and his family out in California. Uh, here again, we have Derek, Zachary, and Natalie. And over the years, time is cruel. But anyway, there we are. And here's a picture of my parents. And I want to, to close the, the... Oh, I'm not quite finished. Nineteen months after Natalie was born, we were due for another one. And that's when I started getting phone calls about from concerned citizens. But um, Claudia got very sick during that pregnancy. She had a convulsive cough that went on for like two weeks, where she just doubled up in almost spasms, coughing so hard, and it uh, it uh, ended up terminating the pregnancy. The midwife came and helped us through all of that, and then informed us that there were three, and we lost triplets. And we buried them there by the dogwood tree by our driveway. And that's where we hope to be on resurrection morning. We're claiming those three. We want those three. Can you imagine raising three perfect children? Okay. No sass, no disobedience, no back talk. Can you imagine children having two perfect parents and never lose their tempers, never impatient? I mean, I, we really look forward to raising three more in heaven, and we're, we're claiming them. Um, here is a picture, I mean, that was a picture of my, my parents, and we're going to close with a little quiz here, close this part. I do want to play two more songs, is that okay? Two more songs to close. I have to play that thing. Anyway, how old was my dad when he had his heart attack, do you remember? Fifty-five. And he was to be dead by five years, be 60. He has passed away now. My mother is still living. But he has passed away. How old do you think he was when he passed away? 82. He was just turning 90. He was just about 90. And I, I think that's so amazing. I didn't, it just hit me in one of my presentations a while back. The doctors gave him five years to live. God gave him 35 years to live. That's seven times five. Isn't that something? God gave it by following our health message in God's plan. He lived seven times what the doctors projected. I think that's amazing. God has given us these things for reasons. Like I was, I was reading when I was snuffing out that perfectly good cigarette, remember? <laughs> that God's plan for our lives far exceeds anything we can imagine for ourselves. All he wants for us is health, happiness, joy, quality of life, and length of days. And I think the length of days is days without number. What do you think? Amen. Eternal life. Okay. So, anyway, he was uh, about 90. My mother is now 92. And, um, you know, the Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. And you know, this is this is my story. I used to wonder about that text, but I now know that that promise is fulfilled at conversion. It's not at the coming of Jesus. When we join the family of God, we have no idea how wonderful the Lord can be to us in the new walk. I've been on both sides. And I'm here to tell you, Father knows best. Amen. He does know best. Um, now I'm going to play the Steel Pan song. It's my, my mother's favorite song. And uh, she wants me to play it at her funeral someday, but it's a happy song. But that's okay. We have the blessed hope, don't we? Uh, this song is... Um, I.
I like this song so much that I recorded it twice on my first CD. <laughs> and uh, let me go off here. The first time, I, the first one was in English, and then I recorded it at the very end in Spanish. So I'm going to play it for you in Spanish. With a little Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> 